Hi, everyone. Dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to the Yale Conference on Governing Citizens' Assemblies. I'm Hélène Landemore. I'm a professor of political theory here at Yale University and a faculty fellow in the Democratic Innovations Program at the Institute for Social and Policy Studies. I'm delighted to welcome you all here. Some of you have traveled quite a distance uh, to make it on time, all the way from the Reunion in the Western Indian Ocean, mostly from France. We are gathered here to discuss an understudied and under-theorized question, which is that of the governance of citizens' assemblies. Citizens' assemblies, for those of you who are uh, not necessarily familiar, or I suspect many in the room are, are bodies of randomly selected citizens convened for the purpose of making policy recommendations. Uh, their attractiveness comes from the fact that they allow for deliberation among a diverse sample of citizens who are normally relatively poorly represented um, in, in regular political circles, including elected assemblies. These assemblies are currently seen by some as a possible solution to the crisis of efficiency and legitimacy our representative democracies seem perpetually mired in. Others see them, however, as a sort of a way to stabilize existing institutions that does not fundamentally challenge the status quo, leading to uh, what's sometimes decried as participation washing. Since the 1990s, when they were first born under different names, including citizen juries or forums, they have now been conducted in many countries in various formats. Among the most famous are the 2004 British uh, Columbia Citizens Assembly on Electoral Reform, the 2012 and 2016 Irish Assemblies on respectively marriage equality and abortion, and more recently, the two French conventions we are here to discuss, the 2019-20 Citizens Convention on Climate and the 2002-2003 Citizens Convention on End-of-Life Issues. So an OECD report documents up to 800 examples of processes that include a random selected component and a deliberative component, although not all of those would qualify as citizens' assemblies per se. This deliberative wave shows no sign of stopping, as evidenced most recently by uh, the UK Labour Party's announcement that they would use citizens' assembly if uh, they formed a government. Some cities, like Paris and regions, like Ost Belgium, have now institutionalized citizens' assemblies. At the large scale, there are talks about a permanent European citizens' assembly at the level of the European Union, and talks of a UN-sponsored permanent global assembly at the global level, partly inspired by the first prototype for a global assembly conducted, I think, in 2021. What does not change across cases, however, is that they are typically governed, steered, or piloted by committees of appointed experts. This fact has been glossed over for years by commentators and organizers alike, as if it did not matter who was in charge of setting the agenda for the citizens, deciding according to which criteria the random sampling would be conducted, setting the pace for the meetings, choosing the experts the citizens would listen to, and shaping the form of the output. With the French Convention on Climate in 2019, however, something changed. First, the convention was put in the position of drafting legislation together with experts by President Macron. President Macron indeed promised to take the recommendations coming out of the assembly, of the 150 members of that assembly, directly to regulation, parliamentary vote, or a nationwide referendum. He said he would use no filter. The Convention for Climate was uh, also uh, um, sort of used the phrase governance committee to refer specifically to the, to the group of appointed experts in charge of running it. So it became a sort of political actor in a way that I think uh, no previous uh, convention uh, had. Its members also developed an appetite for political agency and got a political attention that, uh, to my knowledge at least, has been unmatched so far. Given the now demonstrated political potential of citizens' assemblies, there are several questions, both positive and normative, that demand to be posed and addressed, and that's what we're going to do today in this uh, conference. Among the empirical questions are, very simple ones, like who are the people in charge of the governance of citizens' assemblies, and what kind of power do they actually have? Especially compared to other actors, whether the service providers who facilitate and run these assemblies, the government, government officials who commission them, and the citizens themselves, of course. 
Some of these assemblies seek out citizen input and have even institutionalized the presence of citizens on the governance committees, um, thinking of Ireland in particular. What do we do know about these practices and how effective are they in enabling citizen power and influence? And finally, uh, another empirical question is, beyond the existence of a governance committee where citizens are present, what other accountability mechanisms allow for citizen agency, leadership, and representation? So these are the empirical questions among many that we may want to ask, but there are also a set of normative questions lurking in the background. Who should have power in citizens' assemblies? For what purposes? And depending on how we answer these questions, how should we design, change, or reform the governance of citizens' assemblies, if at all? So this morning, we'll be, answering, uh, we'll be about answering these questions in the context of the two French assemblies the Convention for Climate and the Convention on End-of-Life Issues. The first session in the afternoon will uh, bring these questions into an international perspective, highlighting the diversity of approaches, designs, and questions these processes have been asked to answer and what we can learn from them. But um, these empirical positive questions also um, raise more daunting philosophical questions should such assemblies be more like sovereign parliaments in the sense of having internal autonomy, which is one question, and a type, um, uh, but also in the sense of having their own sphere of decisive influence, whether agenda setting or legislative power. Most people currently cautiously defend uh, uh, for, for a citizens assembly an advisory role. And this seems right, as we are still in an experimental phase and trying to figure out what these assemblies are capable of and what the ideal design should look like. But assuming we settle these questions in a way that opens up the possibility of a more ambitious uh, role for, for citizens' assemblies, a big question remains, how far in the direction of sovereign assemblies should, be we, should we be willing to go? And that will be the final question our um, uh, afternoon roundtable will debate. Before I give the floor to our first panelist, let me reflect about an important procedural decision we made for this conference. We have some prestigious guests joining us today, including uh, Thierry Baudet, the president of the CESE, the third legislative chamber in France, now in charge of organizing citizens' conventions. We have famous philosophers and academics who will share their considered judgment about the, these conventions. But we also made the choice to include citizens in, um, this, this, um, in this conference. Uh, Two former members of the French Citizens' Assembly on End of Life will thus join us physically on one panel and the final roundtable. Five more will join virtually this morning and will be given a chance to react to the various talks during the second morning session. It would have been unthinkable not to include citizens' reaction to what we are saying about them, but we also invited them to share with us their own reflection about the Convention and its governance, allowing them to engage in what is sometimes known as citizen science. Citizen science is research conducted with participation from the general public or non-professional researchers, amateurs. Citizen science is usually used to refer to data collection in areas of study such as ecology, biology, health, astronomy, or communication science. I think it's time we extend this practice to democratic theory as well, more broadly. Citizens' assemblies are, are a new, potentially disruptive political object, and so it seems only adequate that our practice of social science reflect that novelty and potential for disruption in the way we will today talk and think with, rather than just about, the citizens we observed. Let me conclude with a word of thanks. I want to acknowledge and thank our generous sponsor, Mark Gordon, who happens to be in the room, and as well as the Democratic Innovations Program at the Institution for Social and Policy Studies, and the Macmillan Center for funding this conference. I want to thank Alan Gerber, the director of um, the Institution for Social and Policy Studies for trusting me with this project on citizens' assemblies. And finally, I want to thank uh, my amazing team here at Yale, Matthew Myers, Antonin Lassell-Webster, Théophile Penigo, Kira Wishart, Rick Harrison, and last but not least, Pamela Green. Pam is truly the keystone uh, holding the whole thing together. And I know she hasn't slept at all in the last few days. So thank you, Pam, and thank you all. Welcome to Yale. Um, 
as you know, we have a translation uh, system in place, so I might ask Antonin if he's in the room to briefly come and explain it. Uh, yes, please, just explain the QR code and all of that. And then I'm gonna invite the panel, the first panel to come and join us on, on the stage. Hi, good morning. So you have on your program, yes, a QR code uh, that you can scan to have access to the wordlist system. Um, you also have on the on the wall. You will see uh, we 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 put some of the uh, of the QR code there too, so you can be able to follow the translation. Most of the presentation will be in in English um, uh, on that specific panel. Our two last reaction will be in French, uh, so you can choose the language of your choice by using the the wordy system and being able to read the live translation uh, or listen to it if you have uh, earbuds with you. Are good, everybody's there, yeah? Great. And it's my, it's, my, it's my pleasure and honor to chair our first, uh, first panel of the day, so welcome to this conference. Um, uh, today what we're gonna be uh, doing is each, par each, participants, um, each panelist has been asked to do a 10, 12 minutes presentation. Um, so we're gonna, go, uh, we're gonna go in that order. The first one will be Sandrine Rioux, uh, an associate professor of sociology at Bordeaux University. The second one will be Jean-Michel Jean Fourniau, emeritus professor, uh, emeritus researcher, research editor at the Gustave Eiffel University. University, uh, following by Chloé Santoro, a PhD student at Paris 8 and researcher observer of the Citizen Convention on the End of Life. And lastly, we're going to have uh, Hélène Landemar and Théophile Pinigaud. Hélène is professor of political science at Yale University, and Théophile is a postdoctoral associate with the, De the Democratic Innovations Program at ASPS at Yale University. We're going to finish with our two, uh, our two reactions. The first one by Claire Toury. Uh, Claire Toury is the former president of the Covenants Committee of the Citizen Convention on the, on the End of Life. A, and Nathalie uh, Berriot, uh, who is a former participant of the Citizens uh, Convention on the End of Life. So thank you very much. My name is Antonin. I'm a postdoctoral associate here at Yale, too. And I will leave the floor now to, to Sandrine. Thank you. Thank you, Antonin. Good morning everybody and I want to thank you so much Hélène first and to thanks Yale University too because I'm so happy to be here with so many known and unknown faces. So let me start with a question. If the French Citizens Convention on End of Life had failed, who would have been held accountable for this failure? By mischance, as this convention was seen as a success, we will never know. But what all the players involved in this exciting adventure know is that the convention has not been an impassive river. There were moments of grace, but also strong swell and bumpy moments. Things could have gone badly. Thus, this question of failure is useful to find out who did really govern the Citizens' Convention on End of Life, and what did governing the convention meant in this case? I would, like, I would like to share three points, and I won't develop all the points, but the paper is here, but it's a way to open the discussion of the day. So my first point is that the governance of the convention was not only played out in the committee, that was formally dedicated to it. There were a gray area of governance around this committee. We took many, many decisions, but we did not take all the decisions. Some were taken priorly to its installation, such as drawing up the specification for choosing the firm to recruit citizens or for choosing the facilitation team. So we did not take all the decisions. Moreover, we were a hybrid governance committee, a mix of members of the CISE and of outside personalities as I was, and therefore our capacity and legitimacy to steer were uncertain and ambiguous. Above all at the beginning, because the governance design was not so clear at the beginning with a steering committee that was 
uh, near the, the, the governance committees, and this steering committee was an operational body. Uh, he was, it was supposed to, to implement the governance committee's decision, but he has a power to decide to. So it was not so clear at the beginning who were the order giver. Moreover, between the steering committee and the governance committee, we should also mention the role played by members of the president's office and by the president of the CESA himself, who were all keen to take the share of governance and responsibility, especially as the organization of the convention was a major political affair for this institution. The institution was organizing a convention for the first time in a fully legitimate way, and it was important for it. So the first observation, therefore, is to underline this gray area of governance, and therefore gray area of power, which may have weakened the process for a time. By chance, we faced early in the process, at the third session, a major alarm that Chloe and Miriam will mention, as I think, we could call it the voting boxes test affair. A major alarm because we, the members of the Covenants Committee, discovered at the same time that the citizens, a decision taken outside the committee regarding an important vote. This fact was so serious that it helped the Governance Committee to clarify its role and its links with the steering committee, and it helped us take the measure of our own accountability. The second observation is the following. While the Governance com Committee did make strategic decision, the process was largely built up as one maneuvers in the face of events, with decisions made under the pressure, without very precise guidelines, using deliberative engineering or voting methods that were sometimes tried and tested in situ by the facilitation team. So we had often no means to appreciate the relevancy of their proposals. As a result, we often had to navigate by sight, but we had a compass, and a very important compass made up of the principles generally accepted as governing any deliberative process and which you are familiar with. I won't develop uh, all the, these principles, but we can discuss more of it. We've been collectively obsessed with respecting these principles because we were all determined to make a flawless convention. That helped us a lot. But following these principles requires constant vigilance and hard work, hard work. Above all, because we have to admit that there are contradictions, tensions between those principles. So governing the convention means maneuvering without a very rigorous roadmap, roadmap, and therefore with the ability to improvise. And I want to insist on this aspect, that improvisation is a constituent part of the process, as it is in jazz music. Jazz musicians speak of programmed improvisation, which is an art, and this metaphor seems to me to help us think more clearly about what it means to govern a convention. We should certainly be more rigorous in the future, with more codification and guarantees for citizens, but we have to find a balance to live room for the creativity of both organizers and citizens. Because I think it is a fact, a deliberative process cannot be and should not be anticipated in all its details. Third and last observation, the committee governs all the better and more legitimately when citizens' voice became an essential component of its governance. Here again, this had not been anticipated, but first by chance and then by design, we installed the per permanent meetings, permanent meetings we held at each session, um, the drawing lots of, for citizens to take part in the Sunday debriefings, 
and above all, the votes to associate citizens to the methodological choices, even by voting on votes. Uh, and all these were uh, very invaluable, very precious for us. With the, this mechanism, we finally managed to govern on behalf of the citizens, striving to adapt together the process and the framework. So what conclusion should, should, can we draw for the future? I think the CESA should clarify the future governance design, and perhaps it could rely on its own decision mechanisms to steer a future convention. I'm not sure an external or mixed uh, committee, governance committee is useful for the institution. If so, the support of guarantors would then make sense as an external third party, and an expert advisory group could then be added along the lines of the Irish model. Perhaps it could be useful. What is clearer to me is that more formalized mechanisms for involving citizens are necessary. I know we will debate about the self-governance of citizens' convention, but at this stage, it seems to me that a distinct and external governance of convention has a real value. It has a real value to enable citizens drawn by law to <clears throat> constitute themselves as a strong public and not as a weak public. And this for three reasons, and I will conclude on this. First, I do not forget the citizens' distrust of any mechanism other than the drawing of lots to build representation and delegation. Inter-knowledge and inter-recognition requires time and requires being already involved in the deliber deliberative dynamic. So it's a, like a chicken and egg affair that's rather inextricable if deadlines have to be met as well. And this question of the timetable is the main issue that we certainly discuss on. Second, I think we must stress the effect specific to the subjects under deliberation. In our case, we, I think that death has been an ally of deliberative quality in many respects, and also an ally of governance. It has imposed decency and empathy. It has allowed citizens to mix intellects and affects. It has legitimized an equalized position, because we are all die. The subject of active aid in dying is indeed divisive, but the opinion's weight measure results in the convention in a consistent majority and a non-marginal minority. And I think that a more polarizing, polarizing subject with a meaning public split in two would have been a challenge more for governance. So that's why I think it is important that an external governance committee bore the mental burden of accountability for the efficiency and legitimacy of the process. Here, we were accountable for imperfections, mistakes, and could therefore make amends without being suspected of thinking to steer discussion on the merits, not only because of our independence from the government, but also because we were not an emanation of the assembly that had to answer the government's question. So I bet that if things would have gone wrong, the governance committee would have been blamed. Perhaps the CISU would have been blamed too, but it would have been fair enough. But what I'm quite sure is that the citizen would have not been held for failure at all. Thank you. So our next panelist is Jean-Michel Fourniaux. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Hélène, for invitation, your invitation. I am very happy to be taking part of this conference. I will try to, to make my presentation in English, despite my very, very poor level of English. My presentation is about the link between the political mandate given to citizens' assembly, their independence, and the forms of governance put in place. First, I make three 
initial observation. Uh, first obs observation is about the world uh, governance. Uh, it's not used in studies of representative deliberative processes to designate steering bodies, except in comparison, in comparison with France. Uh, in, in Jane Sutter or David L. Stubb or, or uh, the OECD report by uh, Claudia Schwalitz did, did not use the, the term governance, but by the term guidance, direction, coordination. So uh, this raises the question, do these distinct terms designate the same steering functions? Second observation, the governance independence from the assembly sponsor is considered, is considered as a good practice principle in the uh, OECD report, for, for instance, but this is not systematically achieved for the uh, deliberative mini publics studied in the, in, the, in the report, which have a variety of purpose and remits. Hence, what it is a link between the mandate, the independence of governance, and the independence or the integrity of the uh, deliber deliberative uh, process. Third observation, uh, OECD, OECD report brings uh, citizen assembly together with other uh, deliberative mini-publics as uh, a citizen juries, a consensus conference or planning cells. In the same category, even so, their purposes and the situation in which they are set up are quite different. And following the CCC analysis, the French Convention for, for the Climate analysis done uh, with Ellen in the journal of participation last year, we consider useful to distinguish between citizen assemblies as a representative institution, ensuring legitimate forms of democratic representation and other mini publics that remain participatory. Participat Processes. My first point, first, first point on governance issue for uh, deliberative mini public. Uh, the, the links bet between mandate go governance and independence of the mini public. The, man the mandate uh, in, uh, for Irish citizens, uh, citizens, the terms of reference. Not only, not only defines the subjects on which a commissioning public authority asks a mini public to deliberate, but also specifies the form and scope of the expected recommendation and set out the, the sponsor's commitment made to the remit. The assembly independence is built, is built up by verifying the assertions set out in the mandate in particular uh, through uh, governance decision. For instance, in a Gren Grenoble metropolis uh, la la last year made a decision, a Grenoble metropolis made a decision for an independent citizen uh, convention for climate, climate, but made no provision for the organization and implica implication of this independence. So this is a test for the governance. What go governance to set up for, for uh, uh, independence of the uh, citizen assembly? So the, the, the assembly independence is, for me, measured by the autonomy left to citizens in choosing how to respond to the mandate interested to them. So uh, there are relations between political purpose uh, given uh, by, by an uh, authority, a public authority commissioning authority to, 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 to the assembly, governance structure, and independence or integrity of the assembly. The link between political purpose and governance is the mandate. Uh, 
the, the, the link between a governance structure and in independence of the DMP is a question of the non-domination of the assembly by the, the governance structure and the link between a political purpose of the authority and independence is the citizens' autonomy for, for answer to the, to, to the mandate. So, second point, uh, in reading the work uh, on citizen assembly, uh, I identify f four steering functions. It is not uh, like uh, in the paper of uh, Antoine. Uh, uh, strategic management, operational management, scientific advisory, and re representation of assembly members. Uh, the the uh, relationship between this few functions and uh, the uh, wide variety of governance bodies uh, is more easy to describe uh, the task that links the different bodies. Uh, in a Knoka report, Jane Carrick, uh, the, done a description of the, the task and the link between the different bodies, but it, uh, this description uh, the, uh, is not uh, very con conclusive. So I, I uh, try to, to uh, another description be, be between function, uh, steering function, and, and uh, um, governance body, uh, uh, steering bodies. Uh, steering bodies are very uh, different uh, in Irish Assembly, in French uh, Citizen Convention, or in uh, uh, Citizen Climate Assembly UK, for, for, for instance. But uh, the, 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 this consideration, uh, the, this approach to relationship between steering function and governance structure is not very conclusive. <laughs> so, uh, in the absence of a mod model stabilizing the, the link between the independence, independence of uh, citizen assemblies, the political role ass assigned to them, and the form of steering implemented, I simply assert following other studies that their independence has as a necessary condition the independence of their governance. Or, independent steering is resi resulting from the citizen assembly mandate. Uh, the independence of strategic management appears to be a necessary condition uh, for the independence, uh, but this condition is rarely, rarely met for uh, deliberative mini public. They are often steered more or less directly by the commissioning public authority, uh, directly or via a delivery, uh, de delivery team, uh, delivery team uh, with which uh, the sponsor has contracted. Well, it is the case uh, for uh, CAUK for instance. <clears throat> the independence of strategic management is also a pre prerequisite uh, for the citizen autonomy. Their autonomy enables them to become citizen representative, a process which characterizes uh, characterize a citizen assembly. And independence of governance is therefore necessary if the citizen assembly is to be considered a representative institution. In all cases, the arrangement of steering functions should respect the condition of non-domination of its governance over the citizen assembly. And uh, for quoting uh, Rosan Vallon book, uh, uh, Good Government, Dem Democracy Beyond Election, uh, three, uh, three pro pro properties, legibility, accountability, responsiveness, responsiveness um, for, for a non-domination uh, government. Uh, uh, mm. Last point about the French case uh, of uh, Convention for Climate and for Convention of uh, End of Lies. 
for, for the convention for climate, the relationship between the CESE, uh, uh, the, the Council, the, the, the Self uh, Constitutional Assembly in France, uh, put by the prime, prime Minister in charge with organizing it, is the term of, of the letter of the Prime Minister. Uh, organizing the CCC and the governance uh, committee with decision make, making autonomy. It's also the term of the letter of the prime minister. Um, uh, dog, uh, with uh, decision making autonomy to run uh, the, the convention and has not been defined. So it, it is a, 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 a problem and raise uh, many, cash, many, quench, many questions. Uh, so, if we uh, uh, examine the, the relation b between the CESE and the Governance Committee in, in the two conventions, three models are available. Uh, a first model is uh, uh, the, the model of the, of the French uh, the, the public debate uh, institutionalized uh, with a French uh, uh, National Commission for Public Debate, uh, an, an independent uh, author, uh, authority uh, appointed, uh, uh, referred to, well, bon. A first model, uh, 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 the, 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 the mm, well, three model. <laughs> I, I, I I put on the uh, on the Dropbox uh, uh, um, uh, a PowerPoint with uh, uh, <laughs> with my diagrams. <laughs> it, it is. I have no no time to to to. to um, they, 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 they developed the, 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 the diagrams. So, so my, my conclusion is uh, uh, that uh, uh, in France we have two ways for institutionalizing citizen assembly. Uh, follow, following the, the French uh, Convention for, for Climate, two approaches have been proposed. The, the, the first approach is proposed by uh, Thierry Pech, the, uh, the chair of the, the uh, Climate Convention, in uh, his book, uh, Le Parlement des Citoyens, uh, Citizen Parliament. Uh, he proposed that future experiments with citizen convention be hosted by the National Assembly. Uh, so the parliament would become, he wrote, the seat of the many representation contributing to the formalization, formulation of the general interest. But the government uh, has taken a different path with the reform of the CESE, organized by France third the Constitutional Assembly, which is only consultative and, does not, and, and do, does not participate directly in the making of law, uh, the co Citizen Convention organized by, by the, the CESE therefore remain due to, the, to, uh, to this institutional embedding, consultative and without a role of democratic representation. So uh, for in order to make progress in taking it into account the role of democratic representation played specifically by the citizen assemblies, we need to look at their governance in order to compare with the governance of permanent representative deliberative model, like in Belgium, uh, determine how a citizen assembly could have closer links with parliamentary assemblies, including in the way it is run, and uh, 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 looking for the, uh, for the fact that independent, uh, independent governance also appears necessary to promote cit citizen autonomy and thus enable the process by which they become citizen representative. Thank you. Thank you, you uh, Jean-Michel Fournier. Our, our next presenter is Chloé Sandro. Um, I'd also like to thank Ellen Landmore and Théophile Penigo for inviting me uh, here, and uh, Kira Wishart, if she hears me, uh, for managing to bring me here from the small French city of Besançon. 
Um, so, uh, during its nine sessions spread over four months, uh, and in particular during the deliberative phase from session three to six, the Citizens' Convention on the End of Life, the CCFV, showed that deliberation professionals now know their stuff and have an arsenal of tried and tested tools and methods for organizing and conducting, conducting deliberative processes. Um, in contrast, voting seems to have been a much less controlled aspect, yet this convention was marked by a large number of voting sequences, by the fact that they took place so early in the process, and by the leading role they played both in the conduct and in the results of the CCFV. But the vote has been, initially at least, largely underestimated by the organization in its technical, epistemic and political aspects. While the importance of formal choices no longer needs to be demonstrated with regard to opinion polls or referendums, a critical analysis of this kind has yet to be developed with regard to the specific role of voting within a deliberative system. Observation of the CCFV provides some insights into this area. In fact, in the first sessions of the CCFV, voting seems to have been regarded as a formality. It was necessary to be able to photograph the opinion of the collective at regular intervals in order to organize further deliberations on the basis of these. Everything happens as if it were an administrative act, as the deliberations progress and branch out, deepen, become more complex and possibly shift the voting sequences are conceived as necessary stages at once revealing, recording, and publicizing the collective's position at a given moment. So an administrative conception of the vote is based on epistemological realism, presupposing the prior existence of the object, in this case, opinion and or collective preference. Uh, while neglecting to question the performativity of the act itself, strongly depending on the voting methods and timing. Uh, in addition to questions of timing and methods, which we won't discuss today because we don't have time for that, another important issue is the content of the vote. What is put to the vote? This question can be broken down into three points. The subject of the vote, the formulation of the questions and their formalization, that is the link between the questions and the underlying structure of the proposed options. The example of the cascade vote in session six uh, shows eloquently that these three points are of crucial importance in the sense-making effect of a vote and its consequences for the deliberative process. The subject was active assistance in dying uh, but this was confused by the first question to which all the following questions were conditional and which was that of the Prime Minister. Does the framework for end-of-life support respond to the different situations encountered? The second question was directly then, should access to active assistance in dying be open? This was followed by nine questions on the conditions for active aid in dying. All other issues referred to at the time as cross-cutting themes or the whatever questions was defer were deferred to a later vote at the following session. This way of structuring the vote seems problematic for several reasons, but mainly because the sequence of the first two questions and the cascade form created the illusion of a logical sequence. This criticism was raised by the convention members at the following session. Uh, but it was too late. The vote had taken place, the press had picked it up, the subsequent voting sequences on the cross-cutting themes had already been planned, and there was not enough time in any case to resume this missed or rather confisca confiscated reflection on the structuring of the options. To understand both the origin and the stakes of this vote in session six, it is important to point out that it was organized around a drawing, that of the decision tree by graphic facilitator Renaud Combe. This tripartite tree, which spread its branches between yes, no, and whatever, 
became the basis to all uh, the subsequent uh, structuring of the work and votes right down to the plan for the deliverable, deliverable at the end. So this vote in session six is uh, emblematic, I think, of the fact that the choice of the subject, wording, and formalization of a vote is anything but a formality. It produces a reality with, with which we will then have to reckon and which will form both the subject and the framework of subsequent deliberations. This observation argues in favor of abandoning an administrative conception of voting as a recording in favor of a dialogical one based on the idea of an articulation and interplay between voting time and time for collective reflection. Voting times should not be seen as soundings or a switch to turn on the light briefly in a dark room to get your bearings. While voting does provide visibility and accessibility to the content of the deliberation, it is more like a classification system. It organizes scattered elements and gives them meaning according to specific pre-identified needs. To this extent, it becomes essential to determine, to determine who has the legitimacy to identify these specific needs, to discriminate between what is relevant and what is not, and to choose a classification system accordingly. So, as Sandrine said, uh, this wasn't actually very clear in this convention. Who was in charge for those kind of decisions? A uh, few people would probably grant this exorbitant power to a cartoonist. <coughs> Yet, the question never seems to have arisen in these terms in the early days of the CCFV. And it was the government's committee uh, which was probably by default in charge of this type of decision. In actual fact, it was often the group of facilitators who were the real decision makers at the beginning. But the situation with plenary votes had been tense since session th uh, three due to the scandal caused by the premature and unannounced vote on active aid in dying. It was therefore announced at the start of session four that the guarantors would henceforth be responsible for supervising decision-making votes. In retrospect, it is possible to say that the guarantors acted mainly as lightning rods with a ceremonial role that did not really translate into the supervision of voting decisions. The guarantor's guarantee remained essentially symbolic. However, as the work progressed and the convention members repeatedly criticized the voting procedures, the COGUV took the problem more seriously. It is undeniable that voting procedures considerably improved between session three and session nine, the last one. A very clear shift in the attitude of convention members could be observed from session seven onwards. The dissatisfaction expressed following the cascade vote gave rise to a significant increase in awareness of the issue of voting, heightened vigilance and requests to participate in the development of voting sequences. In response to this new vigilance on the part of the members of the convention, the COGUV became more transparent and more accountable. Methodological votes, known as votes on voting, became more frequent, frequent and systematic, and citizens were more involved in the formal choices. However, uh, as we have shown, it was too late and there was not enough time to really reorientate the scope of the work and the plan for the deliverable. What's more, the opportunity that was granted at the last minute to volunteer citizens to develop alternative plans for the deliverable uh, in a hurry demonstrated more than any other episode that the delay accumulated by the conventionalists was irrecoverable. It was partly a structural delay insofar as the way the system worked and the tight deadlines meant that the organization of sessions had to be anticipated giving the COGUV and the facilitator a systematic head start. However, the structural delay could undoubtedly have been partly offset by paying earlier attention to the importance of the decisions on the convention agenda and particularly the voting sequences. 
Deciding on the timing, methodology, and content of the vote is a prerogative that should ultimately fall to the deliberating assembly itself, or at the very least, that it should be able to share, given the importance and uh, the epistemic and political stakes. Uh, the CCFV lacked this reflexivity and self-determination despite the Kuguf's belated efforts to rectify the situation. In the future, it is to be hoped that a deliberative cultural voting will develop. The current technicist and administrative conception of voting would then give way to a massive effort to popularize and appropriate an issue that is certainly technical, but always just as political. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chloe. And our last uh, panelists uh, are uh, joint presentation by Hélène Andamar and Théophile Pinigo. Um, <clears throat> thank you. So, citizens' assemblies have garnered an unprecedented level of public and media attention since the Convention for Climate in France, so 2019. Uh, and <clears throat> as such, as new political entities uh, and um, new political landmark or uh, democratic signal. Uh, as such, uh, the, the, the French Convention for Climate has raised unforeseen concerns in terms of political autonomy. On conducting my interviews, I was struck how, by how ignorant uh, or unaware uh, citizens are of how they are governed and by whom. Who, uh, who makes the decisions um, about the process. And <clears throat> don't, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not their fault. Uh, they're just not involved. And they have already a lot to do, uh, <clears throat> a lot on their plates, uh, regarding the, the subject, uh, uh, the, the substance of the, the, the topic at hand. And <clears throat> it's concerning uh, because arguably the way the process is shaped partly determine, uh, the, de determines the, the outcome. Let me take a couple of examples. In the Convention for Climate, uh, the organizers insisted for the citizens to vote on blocks of measures rather than each of them individually. In doing so, they artificially bent the convention in the direction of consensus. In the Convention on End-of-Life Issues, the form uh, the report eventually took had been decided beforehand, uh, de 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 largely determined, uh, de uh, determined beforehand by the steering bodies. Some uh, citizens-initiated proposals emerged, but they just didn't have a chance in the absence of preparation or means to organize. So not that enlightened, inclusive, extensive discussions among citizens uh, about the voting method or the report format might have ended up with the exact same outcome. It, they might and they might not. We just don't know. But then we don't know either uh, we don't know either to what degree uh, the, 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 the final report should be credited to the citizens or the organizers. And obviously we don't want these new uh, democratic innovations uh, to be their organizers' creators. We don't want them to be mere political artifacts. We don't, we, we want them to, to, to to be capable of speaking by themselves. 
And this is not to say that citizens had no power. Uh, it was actually quite the opposite. Uh, it's worth noting that in many instances, the process organically evolved in the direction of self-government or uh, with citizens expressing strong preferences or using various channels to make their concerns heard. But it was either too late, dubiously collective, or disseminated to ensure adequate self-determination. And my point is, um, influence, even causal influence, is not control. And not uh, any influence is necessarily directional or reflective or sufficiently representative. And this is uh, a problem. And our point is just, it, it shouldn't be up to the participants to bear the burden of, figu of figuring out uh, uh, who uh, makes uh, decisions, uh, uh, by whom they are governed, uh, on what grounds, according to what principles, and so on. So to tackle the information asymmetry and the lack of collective agency, we're suggesting, uh, <coughs> humbly uh, and cautiously, to replace part or all of the externally appointed personalities or civil servants overseeing the convention with a subset of its own members. Ellen might want to elaborate on that, uh, but before giving her the floor, I just uh, uh, would like to step back for a moment and uh, share a few words about what's at stake here. Citizens' conventions have become new sources of democratic representation. Whether it is a good thing or a bad thing, this is a fact. Uh, I mean, we can't ignore the representative claim. Because why were these citizens, uh, why were, were these citizens selected in the first place? If not to act on behalf of and for the benefit of the whole population. This is the, 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 the purpose. The purpose, and uh, as such, as new, uh, uh, as a new form of democratic representation, we want these uh, uh, the citizens assemblies to speak for themselves, and if we want their influence, even and maybe even more, as advisory bodies, if we, we want their influence uh, to be reliable and meaningful, we also need uh, to have them. Uh, uh, to, to, we need them to be politically more autonomous uh, than in the status quo. Okay, so, so Théophile, my co-author, brilliantly um, framed the paper and I and already spoke too much, so I, I just wanted to add a few words um, about my experience on the governance committee. So I was, uh, like Théophile, an observer researcher on the first convention on climate. Uh, and then I was appointed to the governance committee of the second convention on end of life. And it was really interesting to change position if you want to go from the outside to the inside. Um, in the first case, I saw the governance committee from the outside as this you know, um, iron fist on the convention, really shaping and, and dictating the terms, but slowly moving towards uh, sort of relaxing into allowing for citizen input and, and shaping of the proceedings. In the second case, um, being from the inside was an interesting experience of a, of a lack of power, if anything. Being on this governance committee, um, I felt like until about session five, I didn't feel like we had much control on what was going on, that the power was either upstream of us in the cabinet of the, of the president where a lot of the decisions had already been taken, or downstream of us uh, in the hands of the steering committee, the service providers who were really running the show and coming up to us, the governance committee was planned for the next session that were delivered so close to the event that we just had very little time to change anything. And in many cases also um, in ways that, that didn't quite reflect, that didn't always reflect our, our express preferences. Within the governance committee, we didn't have either always super clear um, procedures to determine exactly what we as a collective wanted. Uh, I think we had one vote, or it was very rare that we used a vote, so it was a lot of apparent consensus, which occasionally buried some, some good ideas because 
we seem to all agree, but things didn't happen. And so, it, so I think there are a lot of issues about the governance of assemblies that, and it's normal that they're only emerging now. We needed to experiment for, you know, for a long time and figure out what was working already with the deliberation in the assemblies. But I think there's a fundamental um, theoretical tension between a body that, that aims to capture something about what the public would think if they had time to deliberate and the profoundly technocratic governance of those citizens' assemblies. When you look inside them, um, it, there's a tension there in, in, the, in the conceptualization of the object. And what I liked in the first convention is that they did try to fix that by having representatives of the, of the members on the governance committee, so there were two of them randomly selected, uh, changed every session, who could input the process. We don't know how much effect they had because this governance committee was close to observers. What I liked on the second um, uh, convention is that we also really went out of our way to include citizen feedback through various methods. We chose not to have them on the governance committee, but we, we, we had them, we had more of them, four of them, on the debrief meetings every Sunday after each session where we could really shape and influence, um, I mean, somewhat uh, the, the decisions. We had uh, office hours where they could come and talk to us. Um, we had these voting procedures, which you know were kind of disastrously implemented for a while. It's true, but the intention was truly to hand over power, actually. So that's how we decided, for example, that we were not going to be the one choosing the citizens who are going to go to talk to President Macron at the end, or who are going to address the nation at the end. We we literally thought. We are not legitimate to make that decision. We're gonna, so more and more, as time went by, we just externalized the decision to them in plenaries. Not well, granted, but that was actually a, a, a sincere effort at, at doing it, and I think they understood it that way, because I have to say, one thing that I found remarkable with the second convention is that for all the mistakes we made on the governance committee, and we made many, the citizens really were not suspicious. They were not assuming ill intent, they were really on our side and trying to fix the mistakes as we went along. So I felt like there was a sort of co-responsibility that, that emerged. And I just wanted to mention that, that um, um, idea of co-responsibility because it came actually um, during a Sunday debrief when we had, uh, um, among the governance committee members, we were deploring the fact that what we had demanded hadn't been implemented and we are furious with it. And, and the person who had taken on the that made the decision to completely ignore our, our decision, explained that while well, it was too, too cold in the hypostyle room where we were supposed to have um, uh, you know, a speed dating with experts, so she decided to do something completely differently without telling us, and we were appalled. And so we, we, we discussed that, and then we turned to one of the four citizens, and she said, uh, why don't you make us co-responsible for the decisions? If you can't agree amongst yourself or are not sure, ask us, okay? We can decide whether we want to wear sweaters and coats to make it possible to use the hypostyle room. <laughs> and in that moment, you realize, yeah, the solution is right there under your nose. So why don't we have more citizen voice on the very board that are supposed to govern those citizens' assemblies? So in the paper, we don't go very far. It's not a case for sovereign assemblies or, you know, new parliaments of a... Of a of a popular kind, we're just making the case for self-ruling citizens' assemblies because we think there's, 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 a, there's a theoretical um, mismatch between what these citizens' assemblies are for and the way they are technocratically governed. And on top of that, the citizens want co-responsibility. They demand it and they constantly claim for it and snatch, snatch power from us. So why not go toward that, uh, that solution? Thank you. Thank you to our five panelists. Now we're gonna to go to the reactions. Um, reaction will be in French. So if you take a minute, if you're not familiar with French and are comfortable, please use the wordly system. There's some QR codes on the wall next to you. Um, so our first reaction will be from, from Claire Toury. Good morning and thank you, Ellen, for the invitation. And now I speak French. Voilà. <laughs> um, okay, alors. Bon. Merci, merci beaucoup. Et enfin, c'est vraiment passionnant de vous entendre et de se replonger dans cette aventure un peu folle qui a été la Convention citoyenne sur la fin de vie, et, et donc d'entendre tous vos retours, de se rappeler des séquences de vote. Et je partage tout ce que Chloé a pu dire. On n'est pas des professionnels du vote, et on a une marge de progression qui est extrêmement importante là-dessus. Mais bon, je peux revenir sur toutes les, toutes les erreurs qu'on a faites. Euh, moi, ce que je voudrais dire en vous écoutant, et ce que je voudrais vous dire, c'est que d'abord, rappelons-nous une chose. La démocratie, c'est une matière éminemment vivante. Et donc, du coup, 
on peut tout préparer, tout anticiper, essayer de tout organiser à la fin. Et ça, c'est la leçon pour moi de, de ces six mois de comité de gouvernance et quatre mois de convention. À la fin, ce sont des humains que nous avons en face de nous. Et il y a tout le temps, tout le temps, des aléas. Et donc face à ça, il y a deux, deux options. Soit on pleure, soit on intègre cette donnée et on essaie d'ajuster en permanence ce qu'on fait en se disant, et ça c'est un point, on ne l'a pas dit, mais une chose qui était très importante pour nous tous au sein du comité de gouvernance, c'est qu'on voulait que cette convention réussisse et surtout on est parti du principe qu'on allait toutes et tous se faire confiance. Et ça c'est un point qui est très important. Donc mon premier point, rappelons-nous que la démocratie est une matière vivante et que ça nécessite énormément de travail. Et donc oui, je ne dis pas ça pour excuser les erreurs, il y en a eu plein, mais il faut imaginer ce que c'est une convention citoyenne qui dure quatre mois avec neuf sessions de trois jours à chaque fois, donc 27 jours en tout, et tout le travail entre les sessions, parce qu'il y a ça aussi. Hein. Donc c'est pour ça que moi j'ai quelques points de désaccord avec vous. Euh, la gouvernance technocratique, c'est pas vrai. En fait, on n'aurait pas pu, le comité de gouvernance tout seul, tout faire. Par contre, vous étiez là pendant les réunions, moi j'étais là beaucoup plus, et je peux vous dire que les échanges avec les équipes de pilotage, c'était permanent. Enfin, pilotage, pardon, le comité de pilotage et puis les équipes d'animation, c'était permanent. En permanence, on échangeait. Et alors, voilà, dans un monde idéal, on aurait pu décider de tout ensemble. Je ne suis pas sûre que ça aurait été toujours évident, parce que ce n'est pas simple de gérer un groupe de 14 personnes. Mais voilà, c'est un travail qui est permanent, permanent, permanent. Donc ça, c'est un des points que je voulais partager avec vous. Un deuxième point que je voulais partager avec vous, je vais vite parce qu'on n'a pas beaucoup de temps, c'est la question de la confiance. Et donc, le, le, pour moi, le fait que cette convention ait fonctionné, c'est parce que de A à Z, on a travaillé la confiance. Travailler la confiance, ça veut dire quoi Ça veut dire que quand on fait une erreur, on va s'excuser. Et on s'est excusé un bon paquet de fois. Et donc c'est ça que je voulais dire aussi. Celui qui décide, c'est celui qui est responsable. Et donc à la question posée par Sandrine, pour moi, si cette convention avait été un échec, la responsabilité aurait été la nôtre. À partir de là, on ne peut pas dire que la gouvernance n'ait pas du tout été entre nos mains au sein du comité de gouvernance. Enfin voilà, c'est peut-être plutôt pour, euh, <coughs> pardon, pour, pour préciser ça. Donc euh, la question de la confiance à tous les étages, tout le temps. Mais, et donc euh, ce que, ce que, ce que, peut-être mon troisième point... Euh, une des questions qui se pose, c'est pourquoi on fait des conventions citoyennes À quoi ça sert Et ça me permettra de reboucler sur la gouvernance après. Pourquoi on fait des conventions citoyennes À quoi ça sert Moi, il me semble que quand on fait une convention citoyenne, on décide, et vous allez peut-être rigoler parce qu'on attend toujours les débouchés, mais on décide de faire preuve de courage politique. C'est-à-dire qu'à un moment, l'exécutif, en l'occurrence, décide que sur certains sujets, on n'arrive pas à trancher dans des espaces de représentation classiques. On n'arrive pas à trancher à l'Assemblée nationale, on n'arrive pas à trancher dans les, dans les débats entre les corps intermédiaires habituels, on n'y arrive pas. La fin de vie, c'est typique. On n'arrive pas à trancher sur la fin de vie. La question migratoire aurait été un bon sujet de convention citoyenne aussi. En France, en l'occurrence, mais c'est trop tard. Enfin, en tout cas, pour cette fois. Voilà, il y a, il y a, il y a des sujets qui sont très complexes, on n'arrive pas à les trancher dans les espaces classiques. Et donc, du coup, on se dit qu'on va se déporter quelques instants, quelques semaines, quelques mois, et qu'on va demander à monsieur et madame tout le monde, précisément parce qu'ils sont monsieur et madame tout le monde, de nous aider à construire un chemin. Ça ne veut pas dire qu'on leur demande de tout organiser. On ne leur demande pas d'organiser toute la convention citoyenne de A à Z. On leur demande d'avoir les bons outils pour travailler dans de bonnes conditions, pour essayer de construire un chemin. Et donc c'est là où moi j'ai... Je mettrai quelques nuances. Je ne sais pas si c'est un problème que ces conventions ne soient pas pilotées de A à Z par les citoyens de la convention. Je ne suis pas sûre. Même, je dirais que je ne sais même pas si c'est souhaitable, parce que se perdre dans toute l'organisation peut aussi empêcher de pouvoir se concentrer et travailler sur le fond. Ça ne veut pas dire qu'il ne faut peut-être pas plus partager avec eux la responsabilité. Pourquoi pas un peu plus Mais je ne sais pas si, euh, si c'est si simple et si souhaitable. Donc je pense, premier point... Rappelons-nous pourquoi on le fait et donc faire preuve de courage politique. Et deuxième point, et c'est là où moi j'ai un désaccord avec Thierry Pêche, mais je lui ai déjà dit, hein, pour moi l'enjeu c'est que tout le monde se rappelle pourquoi il est là. 
Et ça ne veut pas dire qu'il n'y en a pas un qui est plus légitime que l'autre. On est tous des citoyens. Ça a beaucoup fait rire mes amis quand je leur disais « les citoyens de la Convention ». Je me dis, mais on est tous citoyens, c'est bizarre de faire comme si euh, on est tous citoyens. Sauf que quand on est président ou membre du comité de gouvernance, ben on n'est pas un citoyen tiré au sort en charge de construire une réponse. Quand on est chercheur observateur, on n'est pas un citoyen tiré au sort en charge de construire une réponse, etc. etc., etc. Et quand on est citoyen tiré au sort, ben on n'est pas dans la, enfin, membre du comité de gouvernance et on n'est pas non plus un parlementaire qui ensuite va être... Euh, potentiellement en charge de la décision. Donc, pour moi, l'enjeu, c'est vraiment de voir ces conventions comme un nouveau maillon dans la construction de la décision, mais de se rappeler que cette décision, elle est construite de façon plus complexe, que certains sont légitimes, et ça, j'insiste là-dessus, parce que moi, je défends la démocratie représentative, sont légitimes parce qu'ils ont été élus pour trancher, mais le monde étant ce qu'il est, les sujets étant ce qu'ils sont, ce serait prétentieux de croire qu'on peut décider tout seul dans son coin. Et donc, là où j'ai quand même un point de rapprochement avec Thierry Pêche, c'est sur les liens avec l'Assemblée nationale, et on en a parlé avec Thierry Baudet assez, assez souvent, là ce qui fait que c'est compliqué, ce qui fait qu'on est frustré à la fois par le climat et par la fin de vie, j'espère qu'on va vite être moins frustré par la fin de vie, c'est qu'on attend la décision d'une personne. Parce qu'en France, le président de la République a énormément de pouvoir. Et c'est un sujet. C'est un sujet, en fait, je pense. Et donc, du coup, ce qu'on pourrait imaginer, c'est qu'une des conventions, une des prochaines conventions, soit organisée à l'initiative de l'Assemblée nationale, puisque le CESE peut être saisi à la fois par l'Assemblée, par le Sénat et euh, par euh, le pouvoir exécutif, enfin, par le, le gouvernement. Et donc, du coup, si l'Assemblée nationale saisissait le CESE pour organiser une convention, là, on pourrait peut-être avoir une articulation un peu différente, puisque... Euh, chacun son rôle, mais la décision, la redevabilité ne serait pas contre les mains d'une seule personne. Et je me tais. Merci. So our next uh, reaction will be from, uh, from Nathalie Berriot uh, for around five minutes. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci Hélène pour l'invitation et euh, j'étais très sensible à ce que tu as dit tout au début sur le fait qu'il fallait faire de la recherche participative aussi avec les citoyens et pas que sur les citoyens. Merci euh, de nous inviter donc euh, Myriam qui est là-bas et moi-même et nos collègues qui sont plus loin. Alors moi j'ai fait la gouvernance de la, la CCAV en 180 secondes, c'était la commande que m'a donnée euh, Théophile et donc euh, qui a vraiment le pouvoir dans les assemblées citoyennes actuelles euh, ce que l'on a vu, et je partage ce qui a été présenté, c'est vraiment une fluctuation en fait, entre les différents acteurs au niveau de la Convention citoyenne. On a eu des moments où, qui ont été, on l'a déjà dit plusieurs fois, vraiment très dramatiques, on pourrait dire ça, notamment à la session 3 avec une directrice de la participation citoyenne, je ne sais pas comment on l'appelait, qui a vraiment fait un truc incroyable avec ce vote-là, qui a été une déflagration au niveau de la Convention. Et ça, à ce moment-là, il y a eu un espèce de sursaut des citoyens et des citoyennes qui ont dit « Là, ça n'est pas possible, vraiment, on nous prend pour n'importe quoi ». Donc ce qu'on a vu, ça c'est un exemple, mais il y en a d'autres, où on a vu vraiment qu'il y avait une fluctuation et qui était assez intéressante, parce qu'on voyait vraiment que ça pouvait monter et descendre. Est-ce que c'est souhaitable Est-ce qu'il est souhaitable qu'il y ait une plus grande autonomisation des assemblées Alors moi, clairement, oui. Les deux mots-clés que j'avais envie de, de vous donner, c'était vraiment co-responsabilité. Je suis particulièrement fière, fière que tu aies pris cet exemple-là, parce que c'était moi. <rire> si, si, c'était moi. C'est pas grave. Mais du coup, je suis très, très fière de ça parce que effectivement, cette co-responsabilité, moi, c'est ce que j'ai dit lorsque j'ai participé au débrief. C'est-à-dire que quand vous avez des sujets qui sont des sujets sur lesquels vous ne savez pas que faire, eh bien, demandez-nous. Nous sommes là. On n'est pas simplement là pour travailler sur le fond. Et ça aussi, pour moi, c'est important. On est là aussi pour travailler sur la forme. Parce que tu le disais, Claire, qu'est-ce qu'on fait quand on fait une convention citoyenne Hier, j'ai eu un moment, une envolée lyrique, et je disais à à Antonin que finalement, quand on fait une convention citoyenne, ce que l'on veut, c'est changer de monde. C'est ça qu'on veut faire. On veut sur une question que la société dans laquelle euh, ça se passe, il puisse y avoir un changement dans cette société. Donc nous, bien évidemment, 
quand on est dans cette convention, ce qu'on veut, c'est travailler sur le sujet, mais aussi comprendre, comprendre comment fonctionne une convention. Et j'étais sensible à ce que disait Théophile. Je pense que ce qui pourrait être une amélioration dans les conventions citoyennes, en tout cas en France, je ne sais pas comment ça se passe ailleurs, c'est qu'on ait vraiment un temps d'explicitation sur ce qu'est une convention citoyenne. Comment ça fonctionne À quoi ça sert Comment ça marche Comment on peut faire pour que ça ne marche pas Etc. etc. Qu'il y ait une vraie euh, montée de compétences pour que nous, alors les futurs, puissent vraiment euh, apprendre et euh, travailler euh, au mieux pour le, pour le bien-être de la société. Ce que j'avais noté dans mes notes, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui me tient très très à cœur, c'est ce que vous connaissez sûrement du droit euh, romain, c'est ce qui concerne tout le monde, doit être discuté et approuvé par tout le monde. Ça ne veut pas dire qu'on doit tous se mettre d'accord sur tout, tout le temps. Ça, doit, ça veut dire que, comme on l'a fait pendant la Convention, par exemple, au fur et à mesure, et comme vous l'avez rappelé, de plus en plus de décisions ont été portées devant la Convention et nous avons pris nos responsabilités. Parce que effectivement, moi, en tout cas, je me suis sentie co-responsable, et tu vous l'avez très bien dit, vous avez fait des erreurs, mais moi, je considère que nous avons fait des erreurs. Nous avons collectivement travaillé à produire un rapport, mais nous avons euh, euh, corrigé tout cela parce qu'on a été écouté et aussi en vous, euh, des fois, rentrant dedans assez hein <rire> clairement, en vous disant que ce n'était pas comme ça qu'il fallait faire, qu'il fallait venir nous voir et que nous avions des idées. Il y a eu, je prends un exemple, le fameux rapport... La forme du rapport, pour moi, nous aurions dû en parler beaucoup plus en amont euh, dans la euh, convention, notamment quand j'apprends, là je comprends que ça avait été anticipé, puisque nous avons eu quelques conventionnels qui avaient des idées d'organisation euh, de la forme pour rendre la réponse, et ça on aurait dû être associé dès le départ, et ça c'était pas très compliqué en fait, c'était simplement prévoir à l'avance de demander à des citoyens s'ils étaient intéressés pour rédiger, pour réfléchir à cela. Et ça m'amène à une autre suggestion pour les prochaines conventions, c'est que, de la même manière que je vous disais, dire au début, expliquer ce que sont ces objets un petit peu non définis pour le, le citoyen lambda, qu'est la convention citoyenne, euh, expliquer, demander aussi aux citoyens et aux citoyennes ce qu'ils savent faire. Ils savent écrire, ils savent prendre la parole en public ils savent organiser des groupes de travail, ils, ils ont peut-être des connaissances sur ce sujet, etc. Et toute cette matière vivante, tu parlais de démocratie matière vivante, toute cette matière vivante, elle permet aussi de faire vivre la convention citoyenne et, et que l'on soit moins dans la réception ou dans la réaction, un petit peu comme là, où on est dans la réaction, mais qu'on soit vraiment acteur des conventions citoyennes. Donc voilà, co-responsabilité, c'était le mot qui me semblait important, et je vais vite, je vais vite. Euh, sur l'autonomisation des citoyens, donc la, la formation, je vous en ai parlé, mais quelque chose qui aurait pu être euh, tout simple à faire, vous avez fait des euh, réunions hebdomadaires où euh, vous avez estimé que les citoyens euh, ne devaient pas participer euh, à vos réunions. Je pense que c'est une erreur. En plus, je comprends qu'il n'y a eu qu'un vote pendant le comité de gouvernance et donc ce vote portait sur ce point-là. Je pense qu'on aurait été beaucoup plus efficace si on avait participé au comité de gouvernance parce que ça nous aurait renforcé la co-responsabilité et nous aurions été un maillon pour faire relais auprès de nos collègues. Donc, c'est une suggestion, mais je pense que vraiment ça, c'était... C'était mal joué. Et puis, euh, qu'est-ce que je voulais vous dire d'autre Je vais m'arrêter là et je, je vous remercie. So, before we open the floor for questions, are there any reactions from the panel on the two reactions? Uh, very brief comments, if you have. Chloé, and then we're going to go uh, uh, and start getting some, some questions. Uh, very brief. Do it in English or French Uh, whatever you prefer. Huh? Whatever you prefer. Okay, then French. <laughs> <laughs> um, oui, merci beaucoup pour tous les, toutes les personnes qui ont parlé. C'était très, très intéressant de revenir sur tout ça. Je voulais juste te dire, Nathalie, par rapport à ce que tu as dit, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec ce que tu dis, mais juste un point sur le fait de euh, demander, je ne sais pas si tu imagines à l'avance, des compétences préexistantes chez les, les conventionnels 
pour mieux utiliser des choses qui se réfèrent, tu parlais d'écrire, par exemple, concevoir le plan, etc. Je pense que l'idée est bonne, mais je ne suis pas sûre qu'il faille, comment dire, catégoriser les gens en fonction de d'aptitudes préexistantes, au sens où, à mon avis, tout l'intérêt d'une convention, c'est aussi de révéler des, des appétits, des, des aptitudes nouvelles et de laisser cet espace ouvert. Je trouve beaucoup plus intéressant d'ouvrir en fait, des activités sur la base du volontariat, comme ça a été fait par exemple pour le plan du livrable, malheureusement trop tard, mais ça aurait pu effectivement être fait avant, et laisser des gens peut-être avoir euh, l'envie euh, d'essayer de, quelque chose qu'ils n'avaient pas vraiment fait avant et découvrir qu'en fait c'est quelque chose qu'ils savent faire. Voilà, c'est tout ce que je voulais ajouter. Christian Lafont ici. Uh, there's a microphone. Is there a mic Yeah, great. Just there in the front. Uh, if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, Pam, just there, the second row, yeah. Sorry. Um, I want to speak in English because I don't know any French. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for your interventions. I saw a kind of thread uh, among all of them. And so I had a question at the beginning because of what Sandrine said, and then that came up at the very end again. And so to me now it's clear it's a question to all of you. So Sandrine said very interestingly that if the convention had failed, certainly it could not be blamed. Those who would not have been uh, taken hold accountable would be citizens. And I wanted to ask more precisely, like thinking in terms of the future, how do we think about that? Because the, the, everybody agrees, and I think I will agree too, that if you charge a body to do something, they should have take responsibility for it. And, and, and it makes perfect sense that everybody seems to agree that they ought to be able to be more sovereign when it comes to doing that. But then I was wondering, would you agree, or all of you, I mean, I'm asking all of you because now I see everybody has, has something to say about that, that if they were co-responsible, then they should be able to be held accountable. On the other hand, then I was wondering, accountable for what? Because if you are a self-governing body and you are the citizens, well, you do what you do. I mean, who is going to tell you that you shouldn't be doing it? You see what I mean? So uh, there is a question about the extent to which they act as uh, representatives and the extent to which they act as citizens and therefore as sovereign. So I, I was wondering if you all have any comments to make on that. Thank you for your question. I, I may answer in French because you, this, the point is too important. Donc c'est la vraie difficulté, je crois, de penser à la fois l'autonomie des citoyens et la responsabilité qu'on veut leur donner, y compris sur la forme du débat et la qualité du processus. Je, je crois qu'il y a quelque chose là qu'on qu peut imaginer, qu'on peut résoudre techniquement. La question de la responsabilité politique, elle est immense, immense. Donc, je, je n'ai pas de réponse très simple à cette question, mais ce que je retiens de l'expérience, c'est qu'il était quand même plus confortable, pour le dire comme ça, pour les citoyens, que la responsabilité, que la charge hein, euh, soit supportée par un comité de gouvernance, par une institution qui ont les épaules larges. Hein, qui ont les épaules larges. Mais ça ne veut pas dire euh, qu'il faut renoncer à donner davantage hein, de pouvoir de décision. Je, je, je comprends bien que c'est un des enjeux de la discussion. Mais d'une certaine façon, ma position, c'est de me dire, mais pourquoi au fond, est-ce que euh, les citoyens dont on parle auraient besoin de quiconque pour s'auto-organiser en convention je, 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 je pose comme ça. Parce que ça, c'est la vie démocratique. Hein la liberté d'association, elle est aussi, euh, au fond, quelque chose sans doute à défendre. Et à ce moment-là, le sujet devient autre. Moi, je pourrais militer pour qu'un fonds de soutien aux citoyens pour s'auto-organiser en convention, pour prendre part au débat public, voire au processus euh, législatif, soit fait. Mais ça, c'est la démocratie ordinaire. D'accord Dès l'instant où on, est, on pense les conventions comme des instruments, des processus de consultation ou de, les, de, de, de législation, 
alors on, on a un outil, hein, un instrument de la démocratie, et il me semble que... Une institution. Une institution, oui, on institue. Et, et que les citoyens, ils sont là, mais Claire l'a très bien dit, au fond, pour prendre leur part dans la division du travail politique. Et je ne suis pas sûre qu'on saurait dire qui est responsable hein, d'un échec du côté des citoyens. On, on a vécu quelque chose, tous, hein, et, et Nathalie aussi le rappelait, c'est les citoyens, ce n'est pas homogène. Il y a eu des tensions, on a peu évoqué ça, mais des débats entre eux. Parfois, c'était important hein, qu'il y ait une autorité euh, qui euh, permette, au fond, de, aussi de trancher, voire de mettre en place les outils pour trancher, comme les votes. Hein, euh. donc, donc là, il y a un point tout à fait crucial. Euh, moi, il me semble, en, en tout cas, que où on est, je serais assez radical, où on laisse l'autonomie absolue. Et les citoyens s'auto-organisent comme ils créent des associations et le font avec leurs outils. On peut aider à, à favoriser une égalité en la matière. Euh, ou alors, il faut accepter, il me semble, que ça soit de la co-responsabilité de décision, mais que la responsabilité politique soit quand même du côté des gens qui ont, encore une fois, les épaules larges pour l'assumer. D'autres réactions Rappelez-vous brièvement. Oui. Euh, alors, non. Moi, je, je, I'm going to speak English. Uh, I don't think we agree, actually, Christian. I think we disagree. My sense is that um, I think Claire said if the if the convention had failed, we, the, by which she meant the governance committee and presumably the CESA, would have failed, not the citizens. That, that that's the sense in which we protect them, which might be a good thing, but is also a way to, in a way, not trust them enough, in my view, with the responsibility of author authoring these reports it means we don't think you can handle it. We don't think you have shoulders broad enough. I disagree with that. I also disagree with Sandrine because, and I'm not sure I'm right, that's why you know, we're discussing all this. My intuition is somewhere else. I think that if we say, no, 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 look, as long as, it, as a CESE or, or a, you know, an existing legislative chamber is organizing those um, citizens' assemblies, their members, the, the, the technocracy in place there, and I don't use it in a pejorative sense, by the way, it's just a descriptive term, should be responsible for the outcome. And what we should do instead is create a fund so that citizens can self-organize. Well, I, I, th I think that's, that, that if that could happen, I'd be, but I actually think that we should create political institutions that are not just at the mercy of who's willing to engage and, and, and organize and keep those things alive. I think the, the free market of ideas, the public sphere, all of that, it, it's very, you know, what if the funding doesn't come through one year? What if, I think the state should be in charge of, you know, uh, creating these spaces that are open to citizens and where they are empowered to self-rule. I mean, that's that simple. We do that with parliament, except we select them, in my view, the wrong way, <laughs> through elections. So why can't we do that for more ordinary citizens through, through a process that it has a bureaucracy? It's basically, you know, if I'm, it's basically the CESE, but where everything is at the service of uh, citizens. So that, that's how I see things. I might be wrong, because I, don't, I want to acknowledge one thing, which is that Claire very rightly pointed out, that do we want to burden them with all that organization? They say they want it. I mean, at least, I, and I swear to God, I didn't plant Natalie here. I, I didn't remember <laughs> it was her. And then nobody's going to believe me, but it's true. And so assuming they, they, like you think that, you know, they should be co-responsible, do they really, is it not too much to ask? I mean, they're busy, they have, well, that just means to me, we need to completely reorganize our society so that it's not too much of a burden. We need to have a bureaucracy at their service so they, they don't have to think every little detail. I mean, I think it's just, question of imagination, for me. Uh, Jean-Michel, vous l'avez eu très, très, très brièvement, on va aller oui. évoquer ça après. En, en français aussi. Non, je, juste pour euh, préciser, il me semble qu'à partir d'un témoignage de membre de la, du comité de gouvernance euh, de la Convention euh, pour le climat, euh, le, le comité de gouvernance a, 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 a considéré que sa responsabilité qui était plutôt une responsabilité organisationnelle de faire aboutir le travail de la Convention. Mais la responsabilité politique, c'est celle des citoyens de produire, de répondre au mandat qui leur est, 
qui, est, qui leur est posée. Je pense que euh, il faut, dans, dans l'idée de responsabilité politique, il faut bien euh, distinguer euh, cet aspect, ces deux aspects, la responsabilité politique qui incombe aux citoyens et pour lesquels, effectivement, euh, moi, je, je suis pour, pour leur donner beaucoup plus d'autonomie dans le, le fait d'assumer cette responsabilité politique, de porter le, leur réponse à un mandat et d'inventer et les chemins et, et la manière d'apporter cette, cette réponse. Et la responsabilité qui est de, du comité de gouvernance, qui est plus une responsabilité euh, organisationnelle, c'est à eux de, fait, de créer les conditions pour que les, les citoyens puissent disposer de cette, de cette autonomie. C'est pour ça que j'ai insisté, moi, sur... Pour ça, il faut qu'ils soient indépendants de, de, de celui qui donne mandat aux citoyens, qu'il y ait un triangle entre celui qui donne mandat, les citoyens et le, et le comité de, de gouvernance, chacun est, 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 ayant justement euh, ses responsabilités. Voilà. Il euh, y a deux autres questions qu'on va passer aux prochaines questions. Si jamais vous voulez réagir à d'autres propos, euh, n'hésitez pas. Uh, so the next question is just there in the back. Yeah? Uh, there. Um, yeah. If you can please introduce yourself before, that'd be great. Um, yeah, hello everybody. Thank you very much for the panel. My name is Sixteen Vanutriev. I'm finishing my PhD on assembly direct democracy or communalism, and I study the uh, Yellow Vest movement um, in France, um, in Commerce, more specifically. So my question actually starts from there. Um, so I'm, I'm from this. Um, I studied the. The, the democratic innovations that were created uh, in um, the movements of the Yellow Vest, um, which is the movement that actually gave birth to, <laughs> to also the, 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 um, the, 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 these conventions, because it was an answer from the government to, um, to, uh, as, as a response for this demand of, uh, of participation. And I'm wondering how we can make the links between the democratic innovations that have been created by the movements and those that have been created in answer to the movements. So basically all these questions about how to govern citizens' assemblies have been totally um, totally encountered by those movements and answered in their own way. But what I think is very interesting here, and, and we can tap on that knowledge, is actually that um, they answered these questions from their own practice. So these questions of governing citizens' assemblies um, they have actually practiced a hundred or so citizens' assemblies before asking themselves how to institutionalize them. Um, this question of chicken and egg problem that Sandrine mentioned was totally encountered as well and, and answered. Um, and I was wondering, so the, 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 the idea that uh, invited space are really framed by technocrats and by policymakers and by experts um, and, and, that, and that it produces and limits what is possible actually in a, is an idea that Cornwall presented like 20 years ago. And so for the self-rule of citizens' assembly, which I'm totally for, <laughs> I was wondering how, um, how could it be possible um, to, in, uh, to include the knowledge of citizens who have already done that? Because the problem with introducing randomly selected people um, in the governance committee is that they have never decided uh, before, they have never deliberated, because it's the, 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 the inner, um, let's say the inner logic of representative democracy to just prevent citizens from deliberating. So, yeah, I'm just wondering how can we articulate that and, and maybe take people who have already organized assemblies from the, the bottom up in the governance committees. Thank you. Great. Let's take one more question and then I'll let the panel react. If you can keep your, your, your question short, that we have like 10 more minutes to go. Uh, just there, Dimitri. Like, yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. My name is Dimitri Courant. I'm a researcher at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I had one very basic question and then a more substantive one. The, the first basic question is why was there the change between having some citizens in the governance committee and in the climate convention versus not having any uh, in the one of the end of life? I'm not sure uh, I got the reasons of that change because it was, in my opinion, a good thing in the first convention. Uh, my, my point would be on the on DAL criterion of economy, I mean, we're in Yale, so DAL is an important figure here. Uh, the fact that those who have the time usually are not everybody and they're not going to be a diverse sample of people. So those citizens in the assembly that say, oh yeah, sure, I can spend more weekends organizing the assembly, those might be a very specific type of citizen. And then isn't there the risk that that would create an elite of citizen within the assembly, and I think it was very much the case in the climate convention, and you can see that when you look at Les 150, which is the association they created afterwards, and there was a lot of war of egos between very dominant citizens that were happy to spend more time and energy in the assembly, but they were not necessarily the 
the, the normal citizen. And, and then the final point would be, is it actually desirable that the citizen set the, the role of their own game? Because one of the arguments for citizen assembly, especially in the paper by Dennis Thompson, is that citizen assembly are great for setting rules of the elected officials, so that elected officials are not setting their own rules. And therefore, having citizens setting their own rules would go against that very powerful argument. Thank you. Any brief reactions from our panelists? We have two more questions after that, so let's keep it short. Yeah, Sandrine. Yeah. Oh, uh, Claire. Merci. Peut-être, peut-être rapidement, les, la différence dans la gouvernance pour vous répondre là-dessus. Euh, la, la, la convention citoyenne sur la fin de vie. Il y avait 14 membres dans la gouvernance, dont, et je ne crois pas qu'on l'ait dit, dont deux euh, citoyens de la convention climat. Et ça, c'était un point très important parce que, du coup, euh, il y avait vraiment une diversité de personnes, mais euh, avec des expertises différentes. Mais ces deux citoyens étaient là, euh, je reprends les mots de Thierry, avec, pour l'expérience utilisateur, en fait. Enfin, ils avaient déjà vécu une convention, et franchement, c'était indispensable de les avoir. Ça a été extrêmement riche de les avoir avec nous du début à la fin parce qu'ils nous ont beaucoup aiguillés. Donc ça, c'est un premier point. Et donc, on s'est dit, alors je, je réponds, euh, voilà, on s'est dit que le fait qu'ils soient là, c'était déjà un plus. Et ensuite, c'est posé la question d'associer des citoyens au comité de gouvernance. On a eu des débats, on a fini par voter. Le vote a donné, euh, a donné raison à celles et ceux qui ne voulaient pas que les citoyens participent. Mais pourquoi Et moi, j ai, j ai, je ne sais plus comment j'ai voté, mais bon, finalement, je crois que je me suis abstenue. Ouais, je me suis abstenue. Euh, mais finalement, pourquoi pas Mais une des raisons pour lesquelles on a voté ça, c'est un des citoyens de la Convention climat, qui était au sein du comité de gouvernance, nous a dit attention, ça a l'air tentant d'associer des citoyens, mais ça a des conséquences derrière, puisqu'après on devient un peu des super citoyens, et on sort de, du, 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 du collectif, et lui, il ne l'avait pas très bien vécu. Il intervient après, donc peut-être qu'il reviendra là-dessus, mais il ne l'avait pas très bien vécu. Ça, c'était un point, un point important. Et deuxième élément, peut-être juste pour réagir sur ce que disait Jean-Michel sur le, la question de la responsabilité. Moi, je crois que la responsabilité politique... Elle, elle se pose à deux endroits. Il y a une responsabilité politique sur le fond, et ça, c'est bien la responsabilité des citoyens, et je, je suis d'accord, mais encore que ça n'intervient pas par magie, hein, c'est pour ça que je disais que c'est du travail, c'est pas d'un coup des gens qui se disent « Allez, on va, on va définir les conditions de la fin de vie en France, dans un, dans un nouveau contexte. » Il y a une responsabilité politique sur le fond qui est la leur, et nous, comité de gouvernance, et c'est vrai, on n'a jamais, jamais, jamais discuté du fond entre nous. Alors peut-être après... Au, resto. Mais dans les réunions du comité de gouvernance, à aucun moment on a dit « moi je suis d'accord avec ça, pas d'accord avec ça ». Je ne sais pas ce que pensent mes collègues du comité de gouvernance de la fin de vie. En tout cas, je ne le savais pas le 4 avril quand on a fini notre travail. Vraiment, c'est important de le dire. En revanche, la responsabilité politique, elle est aussi sur la forme. Et il y avait un enjeu à ce que cette convention fonctionne pour qu'il y en ait ensuite d'autres pour que la démocratie participative soit euh, considérée. Et je crois que cette responsabilité, elle n'est pas que celle des citoyens. Ça, je pense que c'est important. Enfin, elle ne peut pas être que celle des citoyens, puisque euh, euh, derrière, il y en aura d'autres, et que le CESE, que ça nous plaise ou pas, est maintenant la chambre de la participation citoyenne aussi. Et donc, c'est lui qui a la charge d'organiser ces exercices-là. Et donc, il fallait que ça marche aussi euh, pour la suite. Et ça, c'était une responsabilité euh, plus large. Je prends la suite... Euh, sur la, je, crois, je crois que dans co-responsabilité, ce qui est important, c'est co. C'est-à-dire que l'idée, ce n'est pas du tout que la convention citoyenne, ce soit une convention qui soit euh, gérée à 100% par les citoyens, mais que ce soit vraiment en collaboration avec le CESE ou avec des experts, etc. Sur les, la, le fait de participer à, au comité de gouvernance, euh, je pense qu'on aurait pu imaginer des choses comme on l'avait fait pour le débrief, c'est-à-dire qu'on aurait pu avoir non pas des super citoyens et citoyennes qui auraient été nommés euh, pour l'ensemble euh, de la durée, mais il, peut, il aurait pu y avoir une rotation. Et ce qui me fait dire que ça aurait pu être possible, c'est qu'on a bien vu au fur et à mesure où nos collègues, où nous sommes allés dans les sessions, euh, dans, aux, aux réunions de débrief, en fait, il y a eu un rend, un, une reddition, une redevabilité. C'est un mot que Claire a beaucoup utilisé, que moi j'aime beaucoup. C'est vraiment le fait que quand on représente soit ou euh, ses collègues, on va ensuite les voir pour leur dire voilà ce qu'on a fait, voilà ce qu'on a dit, ou on porte leur parole. 
un peu comme là, je suis ici euh, devant vous et après je vais rapporter ce que j'ai dit et ce qu'on a fait ensemble auprès de mes collègues. Et je fais le lien avec euh, les personnes qui auraient le temps aussi sur euh, le fait de s'investir sur euh, les, euh, les, asso les autres assemblées citoyennes. Je ne suis pas sûre d'avoir tout compris ce que vous disiez, mais si on laissait ça à la main, on va dire, de personnes qui pourraient le faire comme ça, il faut effectivement avoir du temps. Mais voyez-vous, moi, il y a quelque chose que je n'ai pas évoqué tout à l'heure, mais il me semble important de comprendre que quand on... Enfin, mon point de vue, bien sûr, hein, modeste, humble, comme dirait Théophile, c'est que euh, c'est du travail. Or, on sait, avec tout ce qui est psychologie du travail, qu'on ne peut pas arrêter l'investissement psychique, euh, physique, euh, moral même, dans, quand on est dans une convention citoyenne. La preuve... À la fin des, du climat, on a une, une association et à la fin là, de euh, en, la conférence citoyenne sur la fin de vie, nous avons, avec 92 autres citoyens, fait une association, les 184. Parce qu'en fait, on veut porter le rapport. On veut, et pour nous, la convention, alors désolé de le dire comme ça, n'est pas un succès. Les conventions ne sont pas un succès puisque nous n'avons pas réussi à faire ce pourquoi nous nous étions organisés. On a bien travaillé, en moins, hein. on n'a pas encore réussi à aller à franchir le, le, le seuil du Parlement français. Donc ce n'est pas encore un succès. Et c'est tout. Let's take the two last questions and then each of you can react on whatever you would like to react. OK, so the first, the first question was there in the middle, Jane Sutter, if you can... There's a microphone just behind you that's, 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 that's arriving. Thank you. Thanks very much. I found it all uh, super fascinating, especially the French, of course, with the, the focus on governing, which I think probably uh, a lot of us in other countries could probably uh, learn a little bit from. So I think, you know, it's really good. But it strikes me that there's sort of the three levels. You've got the political level, then the governing, and then underneath the steering and it's actually the connections and the power between them that matter because you could have the citizens in as much as you wanted in the governing but if the political and the presidency are taking a lot of the decisions beforehand as Helene said then it doesn't matter so much and then if you have the steering which it I, I'm not an expert on the French assemblies but if the steering are mostly the facilitators and they're taking all sorts of decisions and taking uh, deciding on these votes that Chloe was talking about that that are problematic and taking power like where Helene was talking about the governing committee didn't even know what was happening but the facilitators were doing things that perhaps the most important thing is actually to try to envisage of the the governing as being the most important of the three and it should be expanding its power vis-a-vis -vis the other two levels and then including citizens in it. So, um, yeah, just because in Ireland we have um, citizens, but they're in a steering group that's kind of separate. So the, uh, the governing parish goes to them for permission, but they're not involved in the day-to-day -day decisions. And I think it would be better if they were. But I also really like the idea from um, my colleague behind here, that maybe it's a citizen from a previous process, so somebody like Natalie or Claire, who's there because then they understand what the import of some of the decisions are, because if this is your first time, of course, you might um, not understand the, the different bits. But yeah, so I just wondered what you thought about that. Great, thank you. And the last question is here in the front. And for yours, I'm very sorry, we're gonna have to keep the discussion going during the break. Hello, my name is Antoine. I'm working at Mission Public, so on the practitioner side. Um, I love the discussion on voting because you, you try with deliberation to throw it out of the window, saying, okay, we are going to work with other principles, and it comes back every time. So I remember the discussion we had in the conference on the future of Europe at the end for what are we going to use to prioritize the recommendation and what is the threshold for recommendation to pass. And that was, I think, one of the longest, longest discussion. And three hours be before the beginning of the last session, we hadn't an answer. It was very long. And I remember in the French Convention on Climate too. So I think it's a very, very interesting um, topic for further research and discussion on how do we govern 
that part of the process on what is the uh, decision making, final decision making process on the recommendations. And of course, you can decide to have no vote principle, saying, okay, because it's deliberation, but maybe, yes, we need votes because every time they come back. So that's a note. Thank you. So let's go to our panel, maybe like maximum one minute each, if you want to react on, on what, what has been said. We can start from Sandrine and go down the, the, the table, if that's easier, Sandrine. So yes, the, uh, the, the last remark is in link to, to what Jane Schutzer just said. Mais je vais parler en français quand même. Euh, donc oui, je crois, moi aussi, euh, à, à l'importance de ces citoyens des précédentes conventions pour les futures. Alors ça, euh, comme l'a dit Claire, ça a été extrêmement précieux d'avoir les deux citoyens, et Mathieu sera là tout à l'heure, et, et je vais le dire pour moi-même, euh, j'ai souvent changé d'avis après les avoir écoutés, d'accord Par rapport à tous les principes un peu théorique que je pouvais avoir sur les questions, en dernière instance, c'est la voix de ces citoyens-ci, du fait de leur expérience, qui m'a fait euh, décider et arbitrer pour moi-même. Donc ça, c'est très important, et parce que je relierai cet aspect à autre chose que, il me semble, nous savons aussi, euh, c'est que c'est le processus délibératif qui fabrique des citoyens autonomes et puissants. Je, je, je vais le dire comme ça, y compris des processus un peu euh, bancals. Hein. Donc ce que découvrent chacun et chacune à, à, au terme de l'expérience, c'est cette capacité d'action, cette capacité réflexive, c'est cette responsabilité justement politique. Donc, autrement dit, ces citoyens, ils, je, vais, je vais le dire comme ça brutalement, mais ils n'existent pas avant le processus de délibération. En revanche, une fois qu'ils ont, ils ont vécu l'expérience, ils deviennent des acteurs précieux pour les conventions euh, euh, du futur. Et, 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 et voilà, et, et ça, je, je, je veux bien le défendre et terminer là-dessus. Merci, merci. merci. Euh, une autre réaction Une autre réaction de nos panels Jean-Michel mm. Very briefly. En français aussi. Donc, je, je, juste un mot pour, euh, sur, sur la question de euh, le, la possibilité d'une euh, auto-organisation des assemblées citoyennes. Alors, pas, pas dans le sens de, des associations comme la euh, dit Sandrine, mais en, en les regardant comme des institutions euh, euh, à qui est, est confié un mandat par une autorité euh, publique. Je pense que le fait de les regarder comme une institution euh, est important pour justement euh, un peu changer le regard qu'on peut avoir sur cette question de, euh, de, de faire ou non des super citoyens en les mettant dans les comités de gouvernance ou non. Parce que dans une institution comme l'Assemblée nationale, il y a, il y a aussi d'une certaine manière des super représentants qui occupent euh, des, des postes et c'est la vie normale de l'institution. Donc euh, je pense que ça, ça c'est important euh, de, de pas... Euh, si on regarde comme euh, une assemblée citoyenne comme une institution, on peut euh, trouver des formes euh, assises sur le tirage au sort plutôt que sur le vote euh, pour euh, que, que cette institution s'auto-gouverne. Euh, et et c'était une question que moi j'avais soulevée euh, euh, lors de la conférence de de citoyens sur le climat et euh, euh, bon, ça avait été refusé par le comité de gouvernance l'idée qu'il y ait un bureau de, de, de l'Assemblée pour deux arguments à, à très opposés l'un qui disait très, très non c'est le, le comité de gouvernance qui gouverne l'autre c'était justement il ne faut pas faire des super citoyens mais parce qu'on n'avait pas le regard sur l'Assemblée la, comme, comme une institution Uh, thank you for your questions. I just wanted to answer about the um, uh, former citizens from previous conventions. I also think it was it was important to have two of them in the government committee, but they should have been more of them, like a, a collective, maybe a small group. But two persons were was a bit a bit few. I think they were really a minority in the in the government committee. And they, I, I had the feeling they didn't succeed really to connect to the group of citizens, or not enough. Um, and on the on the question about the elites or super citizens, uh, I would say that in this uh, convention, uh, without any possible doubt, an elite emerged. Like, but it wasn't official and it wasn't a problem. It was actually a very good thing. And I think the fact that Nathalie is here today and we discovered it's exactly her who, uh, who told uh, uh, Hélène about co-responsibility is, is not random. It's some citizens really involved and they feel accountable 
not just for the, them the team they had to deal with, but for the form of it and for the future conventions. And this could be uh, of a great use in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I also want to react about the status of uh, super citizens. I agree, they always emerge anyway, whether you pick them or not, they emerge. Uh, the question is, it, is it a problem, and is it a problem in particular for the others? And it is under some conditions, when um, they self-select into processes as opposed to being randomly selected, when they seek uh, notoriety or try to, to stand out in a way that's not useful to the group. But nobody uh, in the, I think, the people who naturally emerge as natural leaders were actually respected for the, the things they brought to the group. So the squad in the, you know, the, the super group that was created in the Convention for Climate was rejected because it was not like that. It was a group of volunteers who were then elevated above others for no particular reason. So, so I think we, we can distinguish that. And I would say that I agree that it's great to have former members of citizens' assemblies on, new, on the governance committee of new assemblies. But in a way, on that vote, and I, I agree, I, I was sweet too. I, I voted you know, for having citizens' convention on, citizen members on the governance board. But Mathieu Sanchez's point was, sh shook me. He said, it will create inequality of status. It did during the convention. But I think it's, it is, it's one opinion among 150. He, wasn't, uh, he had an experience that's different from the experience that the 185 we had uh, went through. So is it truly representative? Out of curiosity, Teofil and I sent a questionnaire to the, as to the association uh, of the 185. And eight of them, um, those who replied, said that no, it, would, it was not a problem. They were doing their job and reporting to the rest of the group. So, so I think this is a completely open empirical question and we shouldn't um, decide anything based on an absence of information. Right now, we just don't know. Uh, yeah, we were running, like, we're running out of, of time, so uh, yes, I, sure. I uh, switch uh, to French too. Uh, so, donc, je, je vais parler en français très rapidement uh, <laughs> et répondre à, à Sandrine d'abord. <coughs> ouais, non, non, pas toutes, uh, mais, mais, mais très rapidement. Uh, si, alors, je, je crois que c'est pas vrai que le comité de gouvernance aurait été tenu responsable de l'échec de la convention. C'est vrai seulement peut-être aux yeux du commanditaire. Je pense qu'aux yeux de la société, ça aurait pas été vrai. C'est des citoyens qui n'ont pas réussi à s'entendre, vous voyez, comme les, les, les assemblées citoyennes ne sont pas efficaces. Et euh, ça n'aurait surtout pas été vrai aux yeux des autres citoyens eux-mêmes. Euh, je pense qu'eux-mêmes auraient été meurtris que la situation échoue et, et se seraient considérés eux-mêmes euh, en partie responsables. Euh, donc, euh, euh, et, et si c'était vrai, euh, ce serait inquiétant. Si vraiment euh, le gouvernement de gouvernance serait tenu seul responsable pour l'échec ou la, la réussite de la conscience, ce serait très problématique d'un point de vue normatif, je pense. Euh, simplement, j'étais chercheur observateur, j'ai observé les, les réunions du comité de gouvernance et c'était merci infiniment parce que c'était très précieux. Et euh, à titre personnel, euh, subjectif simplement, c'était quand même un peu gênant de voir des discussions autour de qu'est-ce qu'ils ont fait aujourd'hui, euh, comment est-ce qu'ils ont géré leurs activités, comment est-ce qu'on peut les aider à faire mieux. Euh, et et, et sans, sans citoyen pour être là pour témoigner en première personne, il y a quelque chose quand même un peu problématique. Euh, et ça vaut uniquement pour le cas français, et ça me, ça me permet juste de rebondir. À quoi ça sert, les assemblées citoyennes Qu'est-ce qu'on en attend Si on en attend la résolution de conflits euh, et d'impasses et de, et de, et politiques euh, présentes en France, ça n'a pas marché. Ça n'a ça pas du tout marché, c'est pas ça qu'elles font. Euh, oui, enfin, la Convention pour le climat, c'est vraiment pas le résultat que ça a eu. Bon, je pourrais entrer dans des détails anecdotiques, mais c'est le contraire. En fait, euh, enfin, Macron se voit opposé par les écologistes le fait qu'il n'a pas appliqué les, enfin, les, les propositions de la Convention et par conséquent, il a perdu des deux côtés. Donc, euh, euh, et en revanche, ce qu'elles peuvent peut-être faire, c'est mon montr montrer un signal que des gens très divers euh, ont réussi à s'accorder sur ces propositions-là. Et ça, c'est très précieux à savoir. Parce que c'est ça que j'appelle une autre forme de représentation démocratique. C'est pas « il faut leur donner le pouvoir parce qu'ils sont légitimes, parce qu'ils nous... » Non, c'est pas du tout. Mais c'est... Euh, euh, ils, 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 ils peuvent réussir à s'entendre alors qu'ils sont aussi divers. Et ils nous représentent parce qu'ils sont descriptivement aussi, aussi, enfin, très divers. Euh, et ils font une proposition qui est crédible parce que c'est la leur. Et, et peut-être que juste leur donner plus d'autonomie dans la gouvernance aussi, ça pourrait contribuer aussi à, à rendre leurs propositions encore plus pertinentes ou encore meilleures. Voilà. Merci, merci. Bien. Donc, vraiment, très, très, très rapidement, 5-10 secondes chacune pour terminer. Oh, <rire> OK, great. Merci. <rire> euh, alors, 
Juste deux points par rapport à ce que vient de dire Théophile. Sur la question de est-ce que le comité de gouvernance aurait été tenu responsable tout seul, j'espère moi aussi que non, et je suis d'accord avec toi, ça aurait été un problème. En revanche, dans le traitement médiatique qui a été fait de tous les fameux épisodes dont vous avez parlé, à aucun moment il a été dit « les citoyens ont fait n'importe quoi ». C'était soupçon de manipulation du CESE, euh, euh, nous avons parlé avec machin du comité de gouvernance, c'est très louche, ils ont envoyé un courrier au comité de gouvernance qui n'a pas répondu, etc. Et donc... Mais en fait, mais même dans le monde, c'était moins caricatural, mais à chaque fois, le traitement médiatique n'interrogeait pas le fait que les citoyens se soient manipulés les uns les autres et, fait des sales coups, et puissent faire des sales coups entre eux, alors que, voilà, il hein, y a eu des moments où ça a été le cas. Le traitement médiatique interrogeait le rôle de l'institution ou du comité de gouvernance dans euh, le, ce qui s'était passé. Donc c'est juste pour émettre une nuance par rapport à ça. Et deuxième point... Pour, être, enfin pour aussi émettre une nuance par rapport à ce que tu dis, je suis d'accord avec toi, le sujet, ce n'est pas simplement est-ce que les citoyens vont réussir à régler les problèmes climatiques ou la fin de vie. Ce n'est pas ça. Et est-ce que du coup, tout, tout va se passer à merveille Le sujet, c'est comment ça se passe quand on donne les outils à des citoyens qui travaillent ensemble d'une manière atypique. Est-ce qu'on arrive à construire un chemin C'est ça, en fait. Et on voit que oui. Et à chaque fois... Alors, je ne te dis pas qu'il y a un débouché, mais dans les deux cas qu'on cite, il y a eu une organisation qui a permis ça. Et donc, du coup, c'est pour ça que je ne dis pas qu'on ne pourrait pas aller un cran plus loin, mais je pense que c'est contestable de dire que euh, quand il y a des organisateurs, ça ne fonctionne pas. Parce que, on, alors, je ne sais, sais pas ce que tu dis, hein, mais on voit que ça fonctionne. Donc, voilà, est-ce que c'est -ce est, est -ce est vraiment un problème que ces organisateurs soient présents For the last word. Yes. Je ne peux pas ne pas finir cette table ronde. <rire> Merci beaucoup. Euh, je, je finirai par ce que j'ai commencé. Ce qui concerne tout le monde doit être, doit être discuté et approuvé par tout le monde. Ça me paraît vraiment hyper important d'avoir toujours ça en tête. On ne peut pas décider à la place des autres. On ne sait pas ce qu'ils ont dans leur tête, effectivement. Et juste un petit point sur euh, tout à l'heure ce que tu disais, Chloé, euh, pour, par rapport à ma proposition de faire que les euh, citoyens et citoyennes puissent manifester leurs compétences. Mon idée, c'était plutôt de le faire dans un mouvement euh, tout à fait vivant, c'est-à-dire savoir que tout du long de la Convention, on puisse apporter des compétences et non pas euh, se figer dans l'écriture ou la rédaction. Je pense que ça pourrait être pareil, une aide, et effectivement, ça permettra à certains et certaines de se révéler. Un grand merci. 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 Merci.